doesn't everything kind of suck? We are two years into a pandemic. We're once again talking about hospitals being overwhelmed. Potentially, we're going to get put into a lockdown. There are no good options right now. We do have one good news story for you tonight, which is that a leftist of the student movement has been elected president in Chile. We'll be ending the, store, the show sorry, with that story, that good news story. So you, you won't leave tonight feeling depressed. Um, as ever, we do want to hear your comments and your questions. Do tweet those on the hashtag Tisky Sour or put them in the comments box. Today was billed to be a pretty dramatic one in Westminster. Over the weekend, multiple government scientists had warned that without further action on Omicron, Britain's hospitals could collapse within a matter of weeks. At 2 p.m. today, Boris Johnson held an emergency cabinet meeting. Patrick Vallance, the chief scientific advisor, spoke to cabinet members there. And according to The Telegraph, a choice would be made between the following three options. So one, the public asked to limit indoor contacts, but without any legal enforcement. Two, mandated curbs on household mixing, the return of the two metre rule and an 8 p.m. curfew on pubs and restaurants. And three, full lockdown. Government scientists were understood to be coalescing around option two, so the banning of indoor mixing and controls on hospitality. And earlier this afternoon, it seemed that Boris Johnson was going to follow suit. Pippa Krara is from the Mirror. She tweeted, hearing that Boris Johnson is considering going back to step two restrictions from December 20, 27th, so post Christmas for a month to help curb infections. Big caveat is that government scientists want him to act now while some in cabinet worried about further restrictions even later. Step two, as I've said, a ban on indoor mixing between households unless you're in a bubble. And in this case, actually, if it was completely step two, which is what we had sort of immediately after our, our January lockdown, it would be outdoor table service only for hospitality. So, so not a curfew, but you can only eat outdoors. And I suppose with this weather, you're not going to want to be there that late, are you? Um, that would be a pretty big move. It seemed, however, that Boris Johnson bottled it. 15 minutes later, Steve Swinford from The Times tweeted this. Boris Johnson is unlikely to impose further COVID restrictions before Christmas after delaying a decision today. No announcement is expected today. Ministers don't think the data is there, despite warnings from scientists. So you see that ministers don't think the data is there. As I've already sort of suggested, the scientists are, are well, they're, they're erring on the side of caution more than the ministers when it comes to data. And we haven't had a press conference for a while from Chris Whitty or Patrick Vallance. But I've collected some relevant stats for you anyway. So the case rates you will be familiar with now are still very, very high. As you can see here, they are as high as they've ever been today. There were 92,000 positive cases. That's the second highest we've had so far. The highest was still on Friday. That record hasn't been broken. What we care most about, though, is hospitalizations. And on that front, we all know there is a time lag. So we still, you know, we don't know what the consequences of, of the cases this weekend are going to be yet. But worryingly, already, we can see that where Omicron hit first, so that's London, we have a steep rise in hospitalization. So at the start of the month, as you can see here, there were one per 100,000 people being admitted to London hospitals every day. Sorry, London here is, is that yellow line. And we are now almost at two in every 100,000 people. So hospital, daily hospitalizations in London have, have almost doubled um, in uh, a matter of a couple of weeks. So the idea that Omicron isn't going to lead into hospitalizations, you know, that, it doesn't seem like something we can be confident about. There are, of course, lots of things that, lots of data that's not included in, in the data I've just shown you. How long do people stay in hospitals? people who get admitted to hospital, how seriously do they get ill? These are the kind of uncertainties that scientific advisors and cabinet members are, are discussing, debating over these few days. South Africa gives us a bit of a clue to some of those questions. I'm going to look at that data in, in one moment. I'm going to show you that data in a moment. First of all, Ash, you know, I want your personal, your political take, this speculation about new restrictions. Could you handle a month? I was surprised by the length of that, a month in tier two. I mean, look, my personal response is repeated slamming my head against the desk. My political response is a little bit different. 
the reason why my personal response is wanting to slam my head against the desk is that I think, like almost everyone else in this country, two years of pandemic have been pretty exhausting mentally. And I think one of the things that's really important to bear in mind is that we have been in this intense state of alertness for nearly two whole years where no one is sure what's going to happen to the plans they make, the things they're looking forward to. And I think that that level of precarity, as well as the very you know, obvious and immediate dangers of what if I get sick? What if one of my loved ones gets sick? Um, the even more intense anxiety for people who are clinically extremely vulnerable or are shielding, I think that that's had an effect on all of us. So regardless of, I think, where you fall on the issue of to lockdown or not lockdown, I think everyone just feels this kind of rising tide of doom and anxiety and, and the people deal with that in different ways. Political response. I think that the sort of slow drip of images from last year of Boris Johnson and various ministers and Tory spads breaching lockdown rules has really weakened public morale. Now, the willingness to abide by restrictions, I think, is different from this time last year. And some of those reasons are very good. You've got lots of people in this country going, well, I'm vaccinated. So doesn't that mean that I am less likely to get it or pass it on or have a severe case of it? Now, that's a very understandable thing to think, but we're dealing with a highly transmissible variant. So even if you're much less likely to transmit it because you're vaccinated, there's still chances that you might. And those are kind of counterbalancing that decreased likelihood of having been vaccinated. Um, even though we're dealing with potentially small percentages of people requiring hospitalization because of the vaccine rollout. Um, and because the vaccine rollout means that people like yourself, Michael, tend to get milder cases of coronavirus, still small percentages of big numbers add up to very big numbers. When you're looking at an NHS, which has really been forced to its knees for many years now throughout successive winter crises, throughout successive beds crises, staff shortages, you have the confluence again of two really worrying trends. One is the upward swing of COVID cases. And then the other is seasonal flu, winter vomiting bug, which you know means that you do have people in hospital, particularly elderly people. So my political response is one of deep worry for those circumstances. And the fact that you have a prime minister who is hamstrung by his own mistakes uh, from being able to act quickly, decisively, and have a semblance of moral authority. His ministers are talking absolute nonsense if they're saying that, you know, the data isn't there. Because by the time the data is there, well, it may well be too late. The NHS may well be overwhelmed. Uh, you've seen Fraser Nelson, who is sort of, you know, the Johnsonite id uh, slash, you know, editor of Pravda for the Home Counties, The Spectator, tweeting at Sage Scientists going, well, why do you only model bad outcomes? And Sage Scientists saying, well, that's, that's our job to model bad outcomes. Um, the things you're asking us to do based on wishful thinking, what if this is you know, less virulent? Um, that's not really our job to do. That's not what we're supposed to uh, prepare the government for eventuality wise. Um, the data is there, but there is a state of denial amongst that sort of libertarian wing of the Conservative Party um, because they don't want to fork out for furlough. They don't want to increase sick pay and they don't want to put healthcare back on the table as something that the economy should be organized around rather than something which is subjugated to the demands of the market. So you have a, a prime minister who is politically restricted from acting quickly, not on the basis of the data, um, and is unable, I think, to command the same amount of confidence from the public because of his own actions and not much else. But just to talk about whether or not the data is there. So, I mean, clearly what the scientists are saying is there is enough data to warrant precautionary action. And I agree with that. But it, it, there is, we're going to talk about South African data in a moment, but I still think we are at a position where it really could go either way. I, I do think we could look back at the Omicron wave and think, God, that wasn't nearly as bad as we thought it was going to be. But that still wouldn't say, oh, therefore, early action was wrong. And I suppose my position on this is, you know, when I first saw this, these, these details about potential tier three for four weeks, tier two, sorry. And the most serious bit for me here isn't, isn't about sort of the restrictions to bars and calves, because obviously that's people's livelihoods, but I do think you can compensate that. So, so as long as you've got the, the treasury that's being generous and saying, look, if we're going to put your business on hold, we're going to replace all of the revenue you would have made. You know, 
I'd be fine with that. But uh, banning people from going to their friends' houses is really, really serious. And, you know, I think you could enforce that at a period where we were in sort of this emergency, we were waiting for vaccines, everything was completely unknown. I think it's going to be very, very difficult to do that right now, especially and I kind of speak from a personal perspective here, there's going to be a lot of people who are coming out of their own isolation <laughs> on, on, on just around the 27th of December. They'll have missed Christmas. They'll be very, very immune because they'll, many people like myself will have had free jabs and a recent infection. And then telling people you can't have one friend round, two friends round for a month. I think that's going to be very, very difficult to enforce, especially when, as you say, Ash, we've had so much rule breaking from the top anyway. The, the goodwill isn't really there. Now, this isn't me saying there are no circumstances in which restrictions could be justified. If it does, you know, if if hospitals are about to collapse, then of course we're going to have to do some unpleasant things. You know, that's the, the even if restricting people's movement in between each other's households is incredibly extreme. It's also incredibly extreme having, you know, our, our health system collapse. So we're looking at two very bad options. There are no good choices here. But what does frustrate me is that what all the scientists have said is that early action is better than later action. I was quite up for, and this was, by the way, before I tested positive for COVID-19. So this isn't just I'm in my house. I want everyone else to be in their house. When it seemed so clear that cases were rocketing, I was like, why not just say right now, Let's close all of hospitality and give them as much money as, as they need so that they don't make, make any losses and then have a bit of a circuit breaker until Christmas or the day before Christmas. People get three days over Christmas. They can go meet their family, come back, et cetera. They're less likely to have COVID-19 because they'll have been isolated for five days. Do another little one between then and New Year. That to me would seem like a, a balance which both respects people's desire to socialize and one which sort of shaves off some of the rougher elements of, of the worst case scenarios. Instead, what we got is is a situation where Boris Johnson is, is still differing to take any action at all. And I think that the difference between the sort of the uh, the decision making that or, the, or the, the preferences of the scientists and the preferences of the politicians is that the scientists are like, well, if we take early action now, that will make less severe action in the future less necessary. And there is a chance that that will be unnecessary, but it's better to be safe than sorry, considering the downside risks. The decisions being made by Boris Johnson and the Tory MPs is that the worst thing we could possibly do is implement some sort of action, which then turns out to not be needed. And so we might as well wait until the bodies are piling high. Actually, I don't want to use that language because we're not going to see deaths to the same extent that we saw in previous ways because of the vaccines. But until we see hospitals at that point, almost on the brink of collapse, that's when we're going to act because that's when acting becomes politically far easier. So that's what's, you know, I'm not anti-restriction, but I am, to be fair, quite anti-waiting two weeks and then implementing really harsh restrictions because you think that your, especially your, your, your younger, the younger electorate aren't going to vote for you anyway. So if you ruin their new year and ruin their January after they've just isolated for 10 days, it doesn't matter anyway. I feel like that the politics of this is all quite cynical. As I say, though, the experts do seem fairly united. Um, these are all quotes given by top scientists and health chiefs to various outlets on Sunday. They were collated in the Politico playbook email. We've got Chris Hopson here. He's chief executive of NHS providers. He said, we need to be ready to, be, to very, very quickly implement tougher restrictions should there be very clear evidence that Omicron is going to lead to significant levels of hospitalizations. Mark Woolhouse also on Sage, the problem for governments and for everyone else that needs to make decisions about this is if we make the wrong decision, if we don't do enough quickly enough, then that doubling time means we pay a very high price and the number of cases that will accumulate as a result. So we're saying even, even in a situation of uncertainty, better to act earlier than later, because if you act later, You've already locked in a lot of doubling times. And John Edmonds also on Sage, we're close to the point where there already may be enough cases in the system to overwhelm the NHS. So they're all very worried. One more for you, the former chief advisor, chief scientific advisor, so Patrick Valance is um, old, or you know his predecessor, was asked on Sky whether new restrictions were needed. He said, in a word, yes. So while... You know, I, I I feel very complicated about new restrictions, but you know, for the sake of honesty, we should say it, it does seem like the government scientists are, are quite agreed that new restrictions are needed. Let's now complicate the issue somewhat. What, why are some people suggesting this might not be as bad as we thought it was going to be you know, a couple of weeks ago? Now, some of them are looking to 
case rates and hospitalization rates in Gauteng, which is the part of, of South Africa where the Omicron uh, variant first sort of exploded. We don't know where it emerged, but where it you know, first rocketed, it's the part of, of South Africa where Johannesburg is, the most populated part of it. Now, what's interesting and what has surprised lots of people, confounded lots of people, is that cases in this region of South Africa seem already to have peaked. We can show you here the seven-day rolling averages of new cases. And you can see that the most recent waves, that's the one we're in, it rocketed. That's why everyone was so terrified about Omicron, because as we as we can see now in London, it's just so, so transmissible. But then surprisingly, it kind of peaked before anyone expected. Now, I've sort of I've been asking about explanations for this on Twitter this weekend, reading some articles. It seems like numerous possible explanations. So one has their testing capacity maxed out. Potentially, like their positivity rates are about forty-three percent. So presumably, there is a limit of them, but they also peaked at forty-three percent for the for the for the Delta wave. Asymptomatic infection leading to underreporting. So potentially, if the the effect of Omicron is milder, then there are less people bothering to get tested because, like me, they just got a very mild cold. Um, potentially, it could be that there's a smaller generation interval. So that could mean that actually, we thought R was very big, which means every every person gives it to five people. If every person gives it to five people, the number of people who are going to get it is going to be huge. I think 80% of the population before you reach herd immunity. If actually the speed was that the R was a bit lower, but we were just all passing it on really quickly because the generation time between catching it and passing it on is two days instead of five days, that could mean that we reach that, that herd immunity threshold earlier on. When I say herd immunity, by the way, it doesn't mean that everyone in the population has got it. It could be herd immunity within networks, which moves to the next one. Maybe it was that it was rising super, super quickly among certain social networks, but then it didn't really move beyond them. That would be the hopeful one. Again, it's, it seems like there's so much scientific uncertainty about this. I haven't read anyone who feels like they confidently know what's going on here. Um, the, the other issue here with this data that's potentially hopeful, again, lots of caveats, does it suggest Omicron is more mild? So we can get this back up in the blue, as I showed you before, that's the case rates. The yellow is the seven day rolling average of new hospitalizations. Obviously they go to different Y axes. So you can see here that in that Delta peak, um, so that was in June and July, cases peaked at 12,000 hospitalizations at around 350 a day. But then in the Omicron wave, so the most recent one, cases hit 10,000 a day, but peaked hospitalizations peaked at only 150 a day. Now, that has got some people wondering, does this mean Omicron is more mild? Should we accept, expect the same thing in the UK? Will each case lead to fewer hospitalizations as they did in South Africa? And therefore, should we not be that worried about the fact that we're seeing record cases every day at the moment because they won't translate into hospitalizations and therefore won't collapse the NHS? Well, again, it's incredibly complicated. Here, it's possible that Omicron is inherently less severe than, than Delta. So it's the virus itself is, is less dangerous, but more likely what we're seeing is the effects of, of population immunity in South Africa. South Africa, unfortunately, had a catastrophic Delta wave. So according to serology studies, 80% of people in South Africa caught COVID-19. Excess deaths topped 250,000. So, you know, we think it was bad in England. It was I think about twice as bad, according to the popular, you know, in, relative to the population in South Africa, and significantly, that is in a much younger po population. So South Africa's median age is 27, the UK's is 40. So if you're going to get twice the number of excess deaths that we got in the UK, that is a catastrophic wave. So that was terrible then. What that means now is that they've got a hell of a lot of population immunity. You might say though, for our purposes, okay, they had natural immunity we have immunity from vaccines and we have immunity from boosters, doesn't that also mean that our Omicron wave should be quite mild when it comes to converting cases into hospitalizations? Again, on this, we're not necessarily out of the woods. On the Owen Jones show on Sunday, the Financial Times data guru, John Byrne Murdoch, gave an excellent explanation of why. The UK has already had its big reduction in severity as a result, uh, as a result of vaccination going into the Delta, the Delta wave. So that's where we saw the percentage of cases ending up in hospital come down from around 10% to around 2%. So a very, very substantial reduction. So what we're saying is not that, oh, ignore South Africa, we think it's going to be just as bad as it has ever been over here. We're saying that um, what we need to happen in the UK 
is for the percentage of cases ending up in hospital to, to continue falling. So it was 10% last winter. It came down to 2% for Delta as a result of immunity. We're saying if immunity got us to 2% and it stays at 2%, then we're in a really, really bad situation coming into this winter because 2% of a very large number um, could, could easily get as bad as last winter. What we're saying is we need that percentage of cases ending up in severe disease to, to fall further from 2% down to something like half a percent or even less. And we're saying that it's not clear necessarily that boosters, for example, get us there because the fact that Omicron is better able to evade um, s s part of our immunity is also a step in the other direction. So it may be that with boosters, we've been running to stand still. What he's saying there is if you compare, you know, that peak of the, the Delta peak of South Africa, yes, their following wave was was less severe. But actually, that's a bit more like a comparison of our alpha peak to what we're about to see now, because we have much more immunity than we did for the alpha peak when we had 4000 people hospitalized a day and upwards of 1000 people dying a day. But we don't have that much more immunity than we did for the Delta wave. So if Omicron is no less deadly than Delta or no less inclined to cause hospitalizations than Delta, we could still see around 2% of cases ending up in hospital. And if we've got 90,000 cases a day, potentially doubling every few days, then that could still overwhelm our hospitals, um, which is why the NHS at the moment seems completely terrified of what is going to happen next. Not only do they have massive absences because there are so many staff members who who get Omicron and then have to isolate, but also they're, they're worried about the number of people who they are, are now seeing. I already showed you how, how sort of admissions in, in, in London were increasing. I've got here a tweet from Sean Linton, who is a health editor at the Sunday Times. He tweeted out this warning from NHS London. It is predicted that the London Ambulance Service, emergency departments and the general and acute bed base are likely to become overwhelmed due to rising COVID demand in the next two to three weeks. So the NHS is I mean, you know, they're, they're kind of begging for more government action than what they're currently seeing because they're, they're terrified as as to what's going to come next. And I mean, that's that's very, very understandable. Um, we'll go to some comments in a moment. We've got loads of really good ones. Ash, I want to throw to you first, though. I mean, I know, you know, you're not an expert on South African data, but there is a there's a broader political issue here, isn't there? Which is, do we do we take action on the basis that it could get really bad, or do we sort of wait until we're sure that Omicron is going to be as bad as we think it could be? Because I do, I do think that I, d I don't think that people saying, "Oh, the Omicron wave could be mild," are purely wishful thinking. I, I do think that's a genuine possibility, but I also think it's a genuine possibility that's an absolute catastrophe. Well, no, but I, my point is that creating policy on the basis of libertarian wishful thinking is a bad thing. Not that you always have to go for the most restrictive option straight away, regardless of what the data is telling you. I would be quite comfortable with earlier restrictions, which end sooner, because it's the government perhaps overreacting, waiting for the data and responding very quickly for it and getting rid of this restriction sooner than having uh, a similar situation to what we had last year, which is just a skyrocketing number of hospitalizations and deaths um, because the government has left taking action far too late. There is one more thing which I, I perhaps wanted to add on to um, as, as a variable, which is what's happened to the number of people getting their very first jab in this country. So obviously you've got a very, you know, a quite a decent rate of, of people who've been uh, double vaccinated double vaxxed, you've got increasing numbers of people who are getting their booster jabs amongst young people. And what I'm curious about is what's happened to that percentage of people who haven't had any jabs at all in this country. Because as with any wave, whether that's Delta or indeed whether that's, you know, Omicron now is going to be much more severely affecting those who haven't had any kind of, uh, you know, vaccine protection at all. So We've had this conversation quite a few times, Michael, which is how do you reach people who are vaccine hesitant, if not outright anti-vax? One of the things that I'd be interested in is, you know, in the period uh, since the vaccine rollout began, is how many of those vaccine hesitant people have tipped over into hardline anti-vaxxers? How many have been won over? And has the sort of pool of people who could potentially be won over uh, gotten smaller? Has you know have we sort of you know vaxxed everyone for the first time who is willing to be vaccinated for the first time and actually what you have is a very resilient 
portion of you know that minority of people of adults uh, who haven't had any vaccinations whatsoever. I mean, it's definitely a good question. I'm, I've just quickly gone on to the NHS dashboard. We have about thirty thousand people getting their first dose every day. Although I suppose it's difficult to know how old is that people who are resistant before, or is that you know people who are under who are between twelve and fifteen who have just become um, eligible. Difficult to know, but incredibly interesting question um, because obviously, yeah, it's. I mean, what what we're hearing from people in healthcare is that yes, th there are lots of people who who are double jabbed who might catch it. People who are double jabbed who or, or, or triple jabbed even who who will end up in hospital. You know, it's a very small minority because it gives you really good protection, but even a very small minority of a huge number can be problematic. But they say most people in you know in a really severe state, there are people without any vaccine at all. So we shouldn't let up on this. Even though vaccination rates are quite high, they can you know they can always get higher, and the higher they get, the safer will all be. Eighty nine point five percent of people have now had their first dose, so that's people who are twelve and above. Let's go to some comments. <clears throat> higher than the sun, eight ninety nine. Thank you very much. These are dread times. Yes, they are. I know. Matter with curiosity, a tenor. Do we have Omicron because we allow Delta to spread all over the world? What comes next? Variant that kills seventy percent more. Um, well, did we allow Delta to, so if everyone had done a zero COVID kind of China or New Zealand style policy, obviously we would have less variants. I'm not sure if, if, if we had more travel restrictions, Delta would have not emerged. I mean, we think Delta emerged in India, um, and it traveled around the world because, you know, people move around the world. It, so I suppose if we all had a zero COVID problem, Policy, yes, that would have stopped it, but stopping these variants does seem to be quite difficult. To me, more important seems to be vaccine equity. So, do we get vaccines to everyone so that you know epidemics are a little bit controlled and people get less serious disease? It's the serious disease that seems to create these variants. What comes next? Variants that kill seventy percent more. Uh, I think no one's no one suggested that's impossible, um, but I, I don't think there's any. And actually, to be honest, Delta was a bit more deadly than the previous because, you know, one of the reasons Delta was more transmissible is because you get a higher viral load and a higher viral load actually is more likely to overwhelm your immune system. What could be happening with Omicron, which is quite interesting, is it seems that potentially it's better at replicating in our noses where we spread it, but worse at replicating in our lungs where we get very, very ill. So, so that is one of the arguments why maybe it's more transmissible, but less serious. But again, very, very, very speculative at this point. That was, I think, one study into lung tissue and something up here tissue. I can't tell you exactly what part of the body it was. Um, Nick Gusset with, with two quid. Thank you so much. Waited four days so far for a PCR result. That's disappointing. I've heard that about, I wonder where you're from. I got mine in 24 hours. I was quite impressed. Um, presumably if you post them, it takes quite a lot longer. And over on Twitch, Scrider writes, pretty sure South Africa is not at autumn winter. True. So it's summer in South Africa, which is why you might expect um, the the R rate to be lower because people are hanging out outside instead of inside. Why that doesn't really explain the very quick peak is because what we've noticed in South Africa is, is a, a, a really dramatic increase and then a leveling off. And that suggests that something has changed. So either some sort of Either there's been a massive behavioral change, which the data shows there hasn't actually been in, in, in South Africa. So it's, I mean, that might be what's happening here. Seems less likely that's what's happening there. Seems like some sort of immunity threshold or, or some sort of population has been, or, yeah, it seems like some threshold has been reached because the seasons can't explain sudden change. It wasn't as if when the R rate was sort of a, a doubling time of every three days, it was cold and then it got hot and then suddenly the epidemic shrunk. So, so while that would explain sort of the R rate more generally, seasons struggle to explain sudden shifts. Um, let's go to our next story. Great. Another photograph has been leaked of the prime minister hanging out at a lockdown breaking party. This time the gathering was in the Downing Street garden. It was in May 2020, so that's the first COVID-19 lockdown. So as you can see here, 
in the picture, that's Boris Johnson with his wife and baby, along with a couple of advisors. One looks a bit like Dominic Cummings. We can't confirm that. So they're in the bottom right there. There is wine and a cheese board on the table behind Johnson's. There are the, the Johnson's and their advisors. There are another four people sharing a bottle of wine. And on the lawn, you can see 11 people, most of them mingling around a table topped with what look like half empty bottles of wine. It all looks like a lovely occasion. And I'm reluctant to judge anyone for socialising outside, even in a pandemic. It's quite a safe thing to do. You can catch COVID if you sit for long enough next to someone who, who is outside. You know, Boris Johnson had just been seriously ill. They've been spending all day together anyway. So epidemiologically, that doesn't look particularly worrying to me. There is, though, a problem. That's because on May the 15th, when this gathering took place, none of the rest of us were permitted such niceties. Indeed, on that same day as that garden gathering, Health Secretary Matt Hancock told the country this. People can now spend time outdoors and exercise as often as you like. And you can meet one other person from outside your household in an outdoor public place, but please keep two metres apart. This weekend, with the good weather and the new rules, I hope people can enjoy being outside. But please, stick with the rules, keep an eye on your family, and don't take risks. I don't even know what keep an eye on your family means in that context, because if you go to a park, keep an eye on your family so they don't hang out with another family. In any case, what was not allowed at that point was to you to go out, like you had a massive garden, to go out to a nice green space and sit down with a group of friends. No, that was illegal. If you tried to do that, the police would probably come along and move you along. At this time, schools were also closed. And even playgrounds were bolted shut to stop children mixing. So this was, other people were not getting to enjoy the same freedoms that people in Downing Street were. Let's take a look at the emergency laws which were brought in in March and which were in force um, in May. So when this gathering took place, they read, during the emergency period, no person may participate in a gathering in, an, in a public place of more than two people, except where all the persons in the gathering are members of the same household, where the gathering is essential for work purposes, to attend a funeral, or where reasonably necessary to facilitate a house move, to provide care or assistance to a vulnerable person, to provide emergency assistance, or to participate in legal proceedings or fulfill a legal obligation. So it was very, very difficult to go out and hang out in a group of more than one person. You, you'd, you'd need to fulfill one of these tasks, often quite unpleasant, you know, involving funerals or, you know, it, it, it wasn't a normal thing to do what they were doing. Now, the government, you know, they'll, they'll be looking through the letter of the law. They'll say, aha, but that law you just read us, that was about a public place. And the Downing Street Garden is not a public place. It's a private place. Now, the obvious riposte to that is that, you know, forget the law on a moral level. Most of us don't have huge private gardens. So you were you know, having this pleasant time with all your workmates and your wife. And we weren't able to because we didn't have massive gardens. Beyond, though, that sort of moral political argument, there is still a legal question that needs clearing up because the law still potentially was broken in this situation. Now, Adam Wagner is a good source for this. He's a barrister, writes a lot about lockdown rules. And he said that while there were no specific laws, as I've said about gatherings in private spaces, there were laws specifying the reasons you were allowed to leave your house. On that front, Wagner writes, the only reasonable excuse which would potentially apply here was the need to work or to provide voluntary or charitable services where it is not reasonably possible for that person to work or to provide those services from the place where they are living. He says, I doubt that being out of home for a primarily social gathering would fit into that. But the reality is that these people were at work. There's no way of knowing from a pick that they weren't working. And unlike later that year, gatherings weren't separately banned in this context. So in the second lockdown, it was banned to have any kind of social gathering with more than two people, even in a private space. Then the issue was more why are you outside of your house? And he's saying that from that picture alone, you can't prove that they were outside of their house for an illegal reason. The government, of course, then have to claim this was a business meeting, which is what they did. Um, Kay Burley grilled Dominic Raab on that question this morning. When was the last time you took your wife and baby to a business meeting? Well, in fairness, um, I don't live in the place of work. 
uh, where I work. So n n that number 10 Downing Street uh, e and the garden is used for work. Uh, it was used uh, throughout that week. I think the PM is there seen just after the press conference he'd done and people, uh, folk at home will remember the daily press conferences and he'd had meetings uh, earlier, I think, with the health secretary earlier in the day or in the week. Um, and you can see staff there. And, and uh, look, um, uh, so it's fundamentally a place of work. So it, this is not a question yeah, of where the... the you can't take your baby to work, especially when we're in the middle of a lockdown and a COVID pandemic, surely? Well, but Kay, as you know, number 10 is also the residence of the Prime Minister. He's got a very young family. And I think if you begrudge uh, the, the, um, his wife coming down in a break from um, the, the, the business of the day, but that's I, I not don't think that's right. She's not and, just and her head around the door, has she? She sat down with the baby, nursing the baby. There's wine on the table. There's cheese there. There's at least 14, 15 other people in the garden. And that's because it's a place of work. They're all in suits, um, or, or predominantly in no, uh, informal no, attire. Well, the, 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 the picture I saw had uh, people... But it's in... on the screen at the moment. Have a look. Well, look, no, the, 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 uh, I think a large number of them... I, uh, to be honest with you, I, look, the Prime Minister is in a suit. <laughs> so we've got used to these ridiculous excuses now. But that was Dominic Raab saying that even if there was wine and there was cheese and it all looked very pleasant, it was actually a business meeting because they were wearing suits. Um, he was also suggesting Carrie had just come down because it was a break in the business meeting. That was, I think, probably the most politically embarrassing part of his answer to Kay Burley. Legally, he then went on to say something that was more incriminating. This is a place of work, but it's also the residence of the Prime Minister. And sometimes, as with many work situations, particularly given the pressures that the number 10 team are under, they might have um, a, a drink uh, uh, after the formal business has ended. That is not anything to do with the social mixing rules. Okay. Uh, and it's consistent with the, the guidance at the time. As I say, that, that, that particular clip wasn't quite as ridiculous as saying if you're wearing a suit, it can't possibly be social but it's potentially more legally incriminating because he admitted the gathering took place after the formal business of the day, i.e. it wasn't a work meeting or even a work gathering. It, it, was, it was purely social. Adam Wagner, the lawyer whose tweets I showed you earlier, went on Sky to assess Rob's comments. I wasn't completely convinced yesterday um, because it wasn't obvious when this meeting took place during the day, whether it was colleagues just popping out to, you know, have some food and drink together um, during the working day, which I'm not sure at that time would have been unlawful. But um, having heard Dominic Raab say um, this morning on Sky News um, that this was a, a drink after the formal business had ended, um, so after a press conference, doesn't sound um, convincing as a work gathering. It sounds a lot like a social gathering. And at the time, um, the rules were slightly different um, earlier in 2020 than they were at the time of these alleged Christmas parties in December. You could have a gathering um, in a non-public space, but you still had to be there with a reasonable excuse to have, for having left your home. And one of those reasonable excuses, the only one that could have applied, was, um, like, was likely to be the need to work, um, where that could not reasonably be done at home. And I, I don't really see how a social gathering, as Dominic Robb seems to have suggested it was, um, after work, so after the working day, would fall within that reasonable excuse. So according to Adam Wagner, they, they probably did break the law. Now, I mean, as is probably quite clear to you now, the legal arguments here are all quite complicated, as the lockdown rules have all been quite complicated. The moral and political argument, much more clear. At that time, at that point in the lockdown, None of us were able to have wine and cheese sitting on grass with a bunch of our friends or colleagues. No, we were all stuck in our homes alone. Or, you know, there were lots of people actually, you know, I was relatively lucky because I was stuck in at my home alone or with who I lived with then, you know, doing these shows. There were lots of people who were actually, you know, having a hell of a time working in a hospital or missing meetings with with loved ones who might have gone on to pass away from from COVID-19. So it is very serious that they felt that they could take liberties in this particular way. Also, what we're seeing, as we have seen in so many of these rows about Downing Street parties, we're being taken for mugs. We're getting cabinet minister after cabinet minister after cabinet minister going out on television and saying something which is just patently nonsense. 
This was Dominic Raab doing just that, also this morning on the BBC. First of all, this was a workplace. They had a drink after what had been uh, a gruelling day and weeks and uh, period. And uh, that was clear and consistent with the, the rules. You're, I, I don't think it's right, if I may say, to conflate, first of all, what would happen in a clinical setting. Clearly, a uh, different set of um, rules applied. Uh, or indeed, the, the wider rules on social mixing. This wasn't a social occasion. It was uh, staff having a, a drink after uh, a busy set of uh, uh, work uh, meetings and and the pressures of the day. So it wasn't a social occasion. It was staff having a drink after meetings. Now staff having a drink after work. That's a social occasion. It might be with your colleagues, but it is a social occasion. There's a reason you don't tend to be paid to go for drinks with your colleagues. It's because it's not work. You you go to work with your colleague. That's when you you know you're sitting at the desk. You're making your policy or whatever they do in number ten. Afterwards, when you go out for wine and cheese, that's a social gathering. Might be with your workmates, it's not work. I mean, it's incredibly frustrating. It also means that it is going to be very, very difficult for the government to make any kind of policy whatsoever, I think, where there are legal limits on who people can hang out with. Because as I say, you've got lots of people who might have been locked down for 10 days with COVID-19. They've been triple jabbed. They're going to hang out with four other friends in a house. And suddenly they're breaking the law. And you're saying, well, in the height of the first lockdown before vaccines, you had people in the government having these Christmas parties, having these quizzes, having these lovely garden parties, even though it was all against the rules. Now, suddenly, I'm supposed to respect the rules that say I can't chill in the living room with four friends, even though none of us are really at any risk of, of COVID, right? I should say, it's not good to say none of us are at any risk of COVID because we, we are all always at some risk of, of getting COVID, especially at this point, catching it and transmitting it even if not for serious disease. But the point still stands that there'll be people doing stuff that is a lot less risky than what they were doing then. And, and we're being told that's, that's illegal. So uh, that's why this is politically very, very difficult. And the goodwill that would be required to have some kind of serious lockdown or serious restrictions, I think, is evaporating. As I say, I should be clear at the beginning of the show, if it needs to be done, it needs to be done. If the hospitals are going to collapse, we have to take severe measures. But this is a terrible situation for us to find ourselves in. And it has a lot to do with the incompetence of this government. It's not just the natural functioning of the virus that's made this all inevitable. Um, let's go to our next story. You're probably wondering, why aren't I throwing to Ash? Apparently, she's having some technical problems in the background. So I'm just going to keep going through the show. Um, Pennywise with 1799. Happy Christmas to everyone at Navara and all the chat regulars. Happy Christmas, Pennywise. Thank you so much for that. And happy Christmas to all the chat regulars. I, I agree with that. Sophie Jacob, agree. Of course, I agree. I, 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 uh, I echo that. It's a better way of saying that. Sophie Jacobs with 449. Merry Christmas, guys. Thanks for getting me through 2021. You are so welcome. Thank you guys for getting me through 2021. God, this would have been so miserable without this show for me. Over on Twitch, ScarDB comments. It's such grueling work having to sit around eating cheese and drinking wine in suits. Can you imagine? Very well said. There's nothing, nothing worse. Can you imagine? You're, you're having a nice time drinking cheese and why do you have to do it in a suit? That's why they were getting paid to do it. Let's go to our next story. When the Conservatives aren't at war about Christmas parties, they're at war about, well, everything else. And this weekend, another dramatic front was opened when Boris Johnson's key Brexit negotiator resigned. This is David Frost, or Lord Frost to you and me. In his resignation letter to the Prime Minister, Frost wrote, the challenges for the government now is to deliver on the opportunities it gives. You know my concerns about the current direction of travel. I hope we will move as fast as possible to where we need to get to a lightly regulated, low tax entrepreneurial economy at the cutting edge of modern science and economic change. So I should have said, sorry, that the opportunities it gives us in reference to Brexit. So the challenge for the government now is to deliver on the opportunities Brexit gives us. And then he wants it um, to be essentially one about low regulation and, and cutting tax. He is uh, a Thatcherite free market Brexiteer. And he's pissed off because Boris Johnson is expected to make some concessions on the Northern Ireland, Ireland Protocol that could give the European Court of Justice some um, power, some jurisdiction over Northern Ireland at least. In short, he wants the government to be more right wing. 
A government source gave this explanation to the Daily Mail about Frost's decision to resign. So they said the new COVID regulations added to his disillusionment with the policy direction of the government in recent months, including his opposition to recent tax rises and the net zero prioritisation. He has made clear in recent public speeches that he does not believe a European style high tax, high spend economic model that has been pursued by Downing Street is likely to deliver the benefits of Brexit. Now, whether what the government are, are offering really is you know, European-style social democracy, I would have a lot of uh, problems with. But it, it does seem quite clear that what Frost is angling for is something worse than what we currently have. He, he wants Boris Johnson to be more right-wing, and that free market Brexit position has a lot of support within the Tory party. Marcus Fish writes in this WhatsApp group, Frost is a hero and 100% right on this. The whole point of Brexit is radical supply side reform and moving away from the EU model. Yet ministers are happy just to give hard won power put in their hands to achieve this to officials who will do the opposite. He also elaborated on Twitter on Sunday morning, supply side reform equals regulating differently to enhance growth jobs and wages throughout the UK aping the EU model and failing to take advantage of flexibility due to Brexit would rightly be regarded by new 2019 Conservative voters as selling out to the same old status quo. Now, in case you, you weren't aware, supply side reforms, that's the idea, you, the supply side is the opposite of demand side. So instead of sort of using fiscal policy to try and change employment levels, what you're doing is you're trying to make the economy more efficient, generally by cutting taxes, cutting regulation, cutting workers' rights, very much associated with Margaret Thatcher. This is what the Tory hardcore Brexiteers wanted Brexit to be about. Where this seems particularly bizarre, this tweet, is he thinks that the people who voted Tory in 2019 who haven't voted Tory before also want that. Now, there is no evidence of that. There is no evidence that the Red Wall voters who put Boris Johnson into number 10 want low taxes and want low workers' rights. They, I mean, everything suggests actually they want the precise opposite. Um, they're also, it, you know, according to other reports, Lord Frost is is very pissed off about uh, net zero targets when it comes to climate change, and also, you know, as, as was evident there, COVID regulations. So, I know I would love to see Boris Johnson toppled as much as the next person, but it does seem pretty likely that, given the shape of the Tory party, whoever replaces him on a number of issues will be much, much worse. Lord Frost has been associated with, with Rishi Sunak. Apparently, you know, the papers have been briefed that Rishi Sunak is on the same page as Lord Frost on some of this. I can imagine, you know, a leadership campaign with Rishi Sunak, Lord Frost next to him. Why do I keep calling him Lord David Frost next to him? I just, yeah, I'm going to use just David. I'm going to call him David next to him. And, and them saying we need to be even more right wing than Boris Johnson. Um, Ash, are you as worried as me? that Boris Johnson is going to get replaced by someone even more right-wing than himself and everything's going to get even worse. The first thing to say is that, yes, uh, all the opposition that is really quite harmful to Boris Johnson is coming from within his own party. It is that coterie of neoliberal, low-tax, deregulate Brexit headbangers who are causing him the most issues. Now, that vision of Brexit, which is radical supply side change, uh, which essentially means why don't we turn the UK into a haven for dirty money uh, slash corporation tax, uh, you know, slash protections for workers. That's not something which has a majority either amongst 2016 Brexit voters or even 2019 conservative voters, what all the polling shows is that actually there's a lot of support for tax and spend. So this is a position which, yes, is hegemonic amongst conservative backbenchers, but it is really untested at the ballot box. So I can see a world where Boris Johnson is defenestrated by this faction of headbangers within his party. And looking at the top contenders for the job, I think it speaks very ill of our democracy that our best option is Boris Johnson, chaos, Etonite, shagger. Um, but whether somebody like Liz Trust, who has seen Liz Trust, who is very much the candidate of the low tax contingent, uh, could do well at a general election, I think is, is a very risky bet for the Conservative Party. 
what Boris Johnson was able to do is put together an electoral coalition which thinks, you know, really different things uh, on tax, but had in common that they voted Brexit, whether that was uh, the shires of the South or the seats in the North and the Midlands that they were able uh, to win over, and that generally there was a consensus on wanting to reduce immigration. Now, that is not something which either me or you believe in, but that is something which is quite important uh, to those 2016 Brexit voters and also to many of the 2019 uh, Conservative first-time voters. There isn't a huge amount of support uh, for the likes of Liz Truss or indeed the vision being uh, presented by David Frost. So it's untested at the ballot box and risky. So yes, knives are being sharpened uh, for Boris Johnson. Yes, it's almost certain that whoever is going to succeed him as Conservative Party leader and therefore if it happens before the next general election, our Prime Minister will be worse than him. But they are also a much riskier electoral proposition. Yes, yeah, so I suppose the only upside might be that they lose, which would be a significant upside. Um, but yeah, it's difficult to say. I, I think Rishi Sunak could win an election if he manages to hide his own ideology, which is, I'm not sure if he's quite disciplined enough. I'm going to go to do very quickly one more story from this leaked WhatsApp group. This one is particularly entertaining. One of the more pleasing revelations of the clean Brexit group WhatsApp leak is that right-wing Tories are as sick of Nadine Doris as the rest of us. It started, so this exchange started with a number of Tories expressing concern over David Frost's resignation from, from the cabinet. So Theresa Villiers here sharing a story about the resignation, very worrying that Lord Frost has gone. Andrew Bridgen, worrying, it's a disaster. Lord Frost was concerned about the policy direction of the government. So are most of the Conservative backbenchers. Marcus Fish chimed in and called Frost a hero. Jeffrey Clifton Brown described the resignation as a hammer blow to Boris and unable to resist, Nadine Doris jumped in with this fawning defence of the Prime Minister. So Nadine Doris says, the hero is the Prime Minister who delivered Brexit. I'm aware, as someone said today, that regicide is in the DNA of the Conservative Party, but a bit of loyalty to the person who won an 83 majority and delivered Brexit wouldn't go amiss. At that point, living up to his... his I think it's probably a self-identified hard man as opposed to a genuine one. Steve Baker stepped in and threw her out of the group. So it says Steve Baker removed Nadine Doris. Then he says, enough is enough. And you get silence for nine minutes in this group, which apparently has upwards of 100 Tory MPs. And Andrew Bridgen comes in and says, about time. Thanks, Steve. And then you get an, uh, an emoji of, uh, of Steve Baker. Um, Ash, the knives are very much out in the Conservative Party. I'd like to see, you know, more. I, I would like to see more of these WhatsApp leaks. So, if you are one of the hundred you know, headbanger Tories in these groups, do share more of them. Do you think they can keep a lid on this for for much longer, or do you think this is all going to explode out into the open? I mean, the thing is, is that no one in the electorate wants to defenestrate Boris Johnson over the fact that he's too much tax and spend. So if there are going to be moves against Boris Johnson, it will have to be using a different political pretext. Now, this drip, drip, drip of images of Boris Johnson and others uh, breaking lockdown rules, that's a part of it. It's an assault on his moral authority. Another might be looking uh, towards the hospitalization and death rates into the new year and really nailing him as the person who's mismanaged the coronavirus pandemic from the start. Now, these are hard lines for, you know, the sort of clean Brexit now group to take because they are all instinctively very anti-lockdown, but that does sort of serve as a useful, uh, you know, and morally virtuous reason to, you know, chuck Boris Johnson out the moving car and install someone else in his place. It certainly won't be, I think, overtly in public facing. Uh, the stuff about low tax. We're going to move on to our good good news story of the night. I did promise you one. And before we get to that, Dan Stringer with 20 quid. Merry Xmas to Team Navarra and a shout out to all the teachers and educators. Thank you so much for wishing us a Merry Christmas. And I, I will echo, not agree with, I will echo your shout out to the teachers and educators who have worked bloody hard this year and it's been really difficult. They have put, as much as we were told, oh, teachers are at no more risk of catching COVID than anyone else. That wasn't true. The teachers I know have all got COVID once, or many of them twice, which is unsurprising because they've gone into the rooms with, with very few protections, with very little ventilation, where 
there was lots of COVID. So you know, the, the whole idea that they were gaslit into saying, no, it's not more dangerous to go into a school than it is to go anywhere else was ridiculous. I saw today there's an advert for retired teachers to come back into the classroom because they're worried, you know, understandably, that in January you're going to have a lot of teachers off with Omicron. My, my response to that was, you, you want retired teachers to go into classrooms? Like maybe if you'd actually, you know, stumped up some cash and installed the ventilation, they'd be willing to do that. Or if you, you know, managed to vaccinate kids a little bit quicker. But given that kids still aren't, you know, not the majority of them are vaccinated, considering you haven't installed any ventilation, I wouldn't advise a retired teacher to go back in and work one day a week, frankly. So, I mean, they've only got themselves to blame. Although, you know, obviously the kids shouldn't suffer because of their failures. Anyway, final story. In 2019, Chile was rocked by protests initially in response to fair rises in the Santiago metro, but soon the demonstrations spread out to wider issues of inequality in education, healthcare, and income inequality. It exploded across the country. Really, really big movement. Just two years later, Chile was faced by a stark choice for president that was in Sunday's second round of its general election. The far right, Pinochet admiring Jose Antonio Cast, you can see him there, or former leader of the student protest movement and leftist Gabriel Boric, who you can see there. Now, luckily, in a comprehensive victory, the 35-year-old Boric, who leads a broad left-wing alliance, took the prize. That was by roughly 56% to 44%. So not overwhelming, but solid, very, very solid margin, proper mandate. And when Cast conceded defeat last night, these were the quite amazing scenes. be a bigger contrast between that scene and how I'm feeling right now. Anyway, here is Boric giving his victory speech, um, slightly disrupted by green laser lights being flashed in his eyes. Y sé que en los años que viene se juega el futuro de nuestro país. Por eso les garantizo desde ya que seré un presidente que cuide a la democracia y no que la exponga que escuche más de lo que habla, que busque la unidad y que atienda día a día las necesidades de las personas, que combata firmemente los privilegios de unos pocos y trabaje cada día por la calidad de la familia chilena. To discuss the result, I'm joined by David Adler, friend of the show um, and member of the Progressive International, of which Gabriel Boric is also a member. David, pleasure to have you on. Thanks, Michael. Great to be back uh, on such a historic day to talk about a victory as opposed to the stream of bad news, including your illness that's been coming in these past few days. Great to see you. Yeah, my, illness, my illness is asymptomatic. Don't worry too much. Although that's not... Uh, anyway, I've made all the fucking qualifications I need to make tonight. Right. Um, can you start by talking about the extreme contrast between the two candidates that, that faced off in this election? Yeah, I think that this election really found Chile at an historic crossroads. We often say that about elections, that they're historic, that they're important, that they're the most important in a generation. But it's not an exaggeration to say that these were the most important elections since Chile's transition to democracy three decades ago. And the reason why is because it's not just about the candidates, but about a whole political trajectory that they represent. So to one side, you have Gabriel Boric, his party, Convergencia Social, which, as you mentioned, is a member of our Progressive International, the Frente Amplio, the collection of parties on which he was running, and Aprobo de Dignidad, the coalition that he fo that formed to unite the left, and even much more broadly, a coalition of feminist, indigenous democratic forces that aligned behind the Boric candidacy. And those represented not just the hope and faith in a kind of social democratic program as competent and comprehensive as that of Gabriel Boric, but it also represented the hopes and the fears and the anxieties and the dreams invested in the social movement that erupted in October 2019 that you led the segment with. Uh, the largest mobilization since the fall of Pinochet to demand the end, the final nail in the coffin of the neoliberal model that was, of course, designed and implemented by the Chicago Boys in, in Chile and then kind of faithfully maintained even after Pinochet's fall in the so-called governance of the concertación of the parties that took over in the process of democratization. So Boric represents a final break with that neoliberal model, 
And that's where the generational politics, I think, are important. Or it belongs to a generation that's often called generation without fear, the generation of democracy, who grew up with the kind of dream of a new Chile being within their grasp, was not afraid, uh, not traumatized by memories of the Pinochet era, and excited to kind of lead on the transformation of the Chilean economic model towards one that was more responsive to the needs of the many, so to speak, rather than the few. So I think that was the force, those are the forces that were aligned, the quite a hopeful vision behind Boric. And the opposite, just to continue on, what the, uh, so that's leading us to the future, quite literally writing a new chapter of Chilean history by rewriting the constitution. So crucially, the 2019 protests led to a plebiscite on rewriting the constitution that was then ratified in large numbers, and they elected a constitutional convention. I mean, this to kind of the Anglo mind seems completely uh, incomprehensible that we would elect young women, indigenous representatives, people from across the country to rewrite the foundational document of our democracy in a way that's really truly inspiring because it could enshrine those rights to health, to housing, to uh, nature itself into the core founding document uh, of, Ch of Chile. So that's all the kind of hope and history invested in the Boric candidacy, which is why we saw so many people out on the streets last night celebrating this victory, because it represents so much more than just a guy I like, a party I like, but a whole political tradition that emerged in the past 30 years. José Antonio Cast stands for everything opposed to that, right? Is a guy who not only campaigned to keep Pinochet in power in 1988, he also massively campaigned, uh, was a key figurehead in the campaign against the constitutional convention process. He is highly regressive in his attacks on minorities, on indigenous nations, on women. Members of his party have called to revoke the right to vote for women, uh, calling it a mistake. Um, he himself wants to make you know, abortion illegal, introduce a new ICE, model in the American agency to detain and deport migrants, you know, create ditches. Well, I'm really, there's a lot of sun coming into my little vehicle here. Sorry about that. The sun is against us, David, because once, when you moved your laptop, which was the right thing to do because the sun was blinding, something happened to your internet, but okay, his, his connection is broken. We're going to have to cut that one short, which is a shame because I was enjoying speaking to David um, about that result. That was our good news story for the day. And the internet's ended it. So you, you got about 90% bad news tonight. You got five minutes of a good news story before an act of God ended it early. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening and to my guests who've both now abandoned the show um, but were both you know, fabulously articulate when I had them. I will be back on Wednesday at 7 p.m. For now, you've been watching Tisky Sour on Navarra Media. Good night.